uh, good evening everyone so this uh, welcome to everyone for the for our session uh, on the spiders where our saliga team webinar and this is our seventh talk of this uh, webinar series so and i am very happy that uh, all are having the same enthusiasm in joining and this is the first time you are even uh, screening uh, live in youtube too and uh, so welcome everyone on behalf of team saliga uh this is uh, this is our very much expected session and we are ha very happy uh, to have dr john caleb here with us who will be talking on the diversity of indian solticid especially the jumper spider spider all are fascinated by jumping spider and uh, the that's the what attraction even even i am attracted very much to the, towards the jumping type spider and we have an authority to speak on that today so about john caleb i think no need of introduction at all for all who have participated it is uh, there and he is a very experienced researcher in the field of spiders and he has demonstrated history of working in higher education industry skilled in taxonomy biodiversity macro photography bioinformatics and microscopy From Looks like uh, there is some signal problem on Dr. Abhijit's side. Uh, please give us two minutes. We'll sort it out. Vipin, I think uh, Abhijit sir is facing some network issue. So yeah, I just can you just me. yeah continue with it? Yeah, give me two seconds. Okay, Dr. Abhijit is facing some uh, signal issues. So uh, let me try introducing Dr. John. Uh, sorry if I make any mistakes. Um, I was not prepared for this. Uh, okay, so Dr. John is a very experienced researcher uh, who has demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry. Uh, he is very skilled in taxonomy, biodiversity, macro photography, bioinformatics, and microscopy. So he has a very strong research uh, background and he has a doctorate of science uh, focused in uh, zoology and biotechnology from Madras uh, Christian College, Chennai. So currently he's a research associate, a research scholar in Madras uh, Christian College. And uh, he has introduced, he has authored an astonishing 72 publications so far. So he's considered one of the uh, very few uh, authorities on jumping spiders of India. So we are very glad to have him on board. Uh, Dr. John, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for uh, uh, giving us your time today. Uh, we, would Thank let you. You, we would let you take over the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Team Saliga, for giving me this opportunity. I hope I'm audible to everybody. Uh, so we'll directly get into the topic. The, the diversity 
and the taxonomy of Indian salt acids. So we'll just skim through these contents today. Uh, introduction, history of salt acid research in India, and then why study salt acids, general morphology of the uh, animals that we are going to study this day, and the preservation examination methods, how to identify, and what is the present scenario of diversity that we know about Indian spiders. And then we'll get into the taxonomy of uh, Indian spiders and then what problems we face while studying uh, spider taxonomy. And then the importance of type collections, importance of museums uh, in general, and then the application of modern techniques, say DNA barcoding uh, methods and the other uh, bioinformatic tools, and then natural history observations, field guides, digital taxonomic resources, and the way forward. So we'll get into the topic right now. So I hope I'm audible to all of you. Hello? Yes, uh, you are audible now. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, so salt acids are commonly known as jumping spiders, which belong to the family Salticidae. And uh, it is the largest family comprising about 13% of all known species. So there are about 48,000 described species that we know of all spiders. And over 6,000 species have been described, of which those are all uh, jumping spiders belonging to the family Salticidae. And we have about 644 genera that are known worldwide. So Indian, for Indian diversity, we have about 268 species that are known, uh, classified under 96 genera. So these spiders can be easily recognized by their large anterior median eyes, which uh, we will be able to see here in this image that we have given here. So uh, these are easily recognized by these large anterior median eyes. They have the best vision among arthropods, and then uh, they can also uh, jump long distances. So that's how they got their common name, jumping spiders. They uh, usually jump about uh, 10 to 40 times their body length. So these are diurnal hunters and mostly active during the day. Uh, and these are adorned with beautiful patterns, and various colors, and they have diverse body forms, which I'll be showing in the next slide. So here you can see uh, these beetle mimicking salt acids in the first two images here. And then here you have beautiful patterns and colors, metallic colors in this species. Uh, these are found in Southeast Asia. And here is a species uh, commonly found in India, which mimics the shape of a, a wasp. Uh, and then here you have diverse body forms uh, and mimicking salt acids belonging to this uh, genus Mirmaracne. There are a lot of other uh, diverse salt acids that we can find uh, throughout the world. And we'll just skim through the uh, history of salt acids that uh, uh, the taxonomy and the diversity studies uh, that have taken place in India. So some of the earliest works, the first work probably uh, was by uh, Sandiwal in 1833, who described uh, a hyla species from uh, East Bengalia. So uh, he has mentioned as East Bengalia, so probably it must be somewhere in Bengal, uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh probably uh, together. And then uh, in 1839, Meckley has described another ant mimicking species uh, from again, Bengal and Westwood. In 1841, he has described another Mirmaracne species uh, from North India. He has not mentioned which uh, location exactly from North India. And then we have, after so many years, uh, after 1841, uh, so 40 years later, Eugene Simon described several Indian species uh, starting from 1885 to 1902. He has described a lot of species uh, all over the world and uh, among which there are a lot of Indian species that he has described across India. And then uh, Thorrell in 1891, he worked on the fauna from uh, Nicobar Islands and he described a lot of species from there. And then Peckham and Peckham, uh, these uh, uh, workers, they worked on a few species from uh, Calcutta and also from Himalayas. And also for most of the work there, uh, they have also worked on a species from Sri Lanka. And then Pocock uh, in 1904 has recorded a few jumping spiders from Maldives Islands and the Lakshadweep Islands. And then we have Narayan, uh, Narayan in 1915, he worked on uh, ant mimicking spiders. He described about six to seven different species of ant, ant mimicking uh, jumping spiders. And we have Mukherjee in 1930, 
who also worked on ant mimicking uh, jumping spiders. And we have a German uh, worker, Ray Moser, in 1934. He worked on uh, mostly the spiders from South India and Nil Greece. Uh, and he described a few species, including the uh, Stenellurilis lesserti, that the colorful spider that we have seen in the beginning of the first slide. Uh, and we have Caporiaco. In 1935, who worked on the Karakoram range in the northwestern Himalayan region. And then we have Tikadar, who described a lot of uh, species across India, uh, mostly from Maharashtra and West Bengal, and uh, these places. And then along with other workers, Tikadar Biswas, Tikadar Malhotra, they have described a few species. And again, Bradu, uh, in 1980, he described uh, species from uh, Punjab. And then we have Biswas, and other few workers uh, who have worked from, uh, and then uh, from Punjab, these people, uh, Sadhana and co workers, they describe a few species from uh, the North India. And we have these saltisidologists, very prolific among them is Eugene Simon, who described about uh, not only uh, uh, jumping spiders, he worked on uh, spiders in general. And he described about uh, more than 3,000 species, which are still valid. Most of them are valid uh, even this day. And we have Dr. Jesse Prozinski, a Polish arachnologist. Uh, he uh, specialized on salt acids, and uh, he also maintains a database. And he has worked on several collections across India, and uh, 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 which were deposited in uh, various museums abroad. So the Hungarian Museum and California Academy of Sciences and other places where Indian specimens were deposited. And he worked on those collections. And not only these, he also illustrated a lot of uh, species which were known only from the original descriptions. Uh, those descriptions are outdated, completely outdated. And we will not be able to identify most of the species. But he uh, illustrated them for the first time. And uh, based on his drawings, we are able to recognize a lot of other species that we can uh, see nowadays. And then here is Fred Wanless, uh, who recently passed away. He did a great work on Indian spiders and Sri Lankan spiders, uh, not only uh, on Indian forms and Sri Lankan forms, he also worked on Southeast Asian spiders, African spiders, and uh, mostly on the basal salt acid groups. Uh, and he described a few species from India. And we have Dr. Loganov who also described a lot of species from uh, South India and also from uh, the Eastern Himalayas. And we also have two Indians here, Dr. Biket Tikar, uh, as we can see. Uh, he has described a lot of uh, few species from a lot, a lot of spiders. In fact, like uh, 300 species of Indian spiders he has described. And among them, a few salt seeds are there. And we have Dr. Uwe Kajbe. He also has described about 175 species of spiders and then among them, we have a few salt acids. And we have Dr. Uh, Suresh Benjamin. Uh, he has worked on the Southeast Asian salt acids and also uh, the, both uh, the phylogenetic analysis. Uh, he has worked on uh, Indian forms also recently and has described about uh, more than five species from India. And we have Dr. Wayne Madison here who has uh, Combined both molecular approaches and morphological approaches is given the most recent classification of the salt acid uh, classification system that we have right now. In 2015, he has uh, given the classification system. So these are a few salt acidologists who have uh, greatly increased our knowledge on uh, Indian forms. And so why study salt acids in general? So um, these are found in a variety of environments. There are a lot of species. The diversity is very high. This is the most diverse uh, spider family in the world. And we have a lot of uh, uh, species that have been adapted. Uh, even they are found from the driest deserts to the moist tropical rainforests. And you can also find them. Uh, one species was uh, described from the uh, Mount Everest on mountain tops. Uh, they can be uh, used as study organisms for behavioral, behavior, behavior, sexual selection, and then for ecological uh, prey predator relationship and foraging, ecological uh, studies, and then phylogenetic and evolutionary studies. So these are great model organisms to study uh, these. 
and uh, spiders also play an important role in agricultural ecosystems so they play a balancing role in the ecosystem as both as predators and prey for other creatures and they are natural excellent natural predators of uh, pest pest uh, species like thrips caterpillars aphids plant bugs leaf hoppers flies etc and uh, recently biocon they are uh, used in integrated pest management also for biocontrol which also helps in the reduce in the usage of pesticides in agriculture so going on to the uh, preservation and examination so specimens are usually preserved in 70% alcohol or ethyl alcohol for preservation and then for molecular uh, methods they usually do it in either in 95% uh, molecular grade ethanol or in 100% molecular grade ethanol and usually specimens are stored either in minus 20 or minus 40 or minus 80 degrees uh, if they are going to be processed further for DNA extraction or other molecular studies. And for uh, observation, examination and dissection, uh, we use a stereo zoom microscope as you can see here. So after the specimens are um, preserved, uh, they can be taken out and then can be examined in detail. Uh, so the most important uh, identification characters, uh, taxonomic characters, in fact, are found in the uh, genitalia, the male uh, male palps and the female genitalia, the vagina, as they call it. So male palps are usually detached and then uh, examined and also kept under uh, in separate vials along with the original specimens. And female genitalia, usually uh, you'll have to dissect it out and then take out, clear the internal uh, tissues, the soft tissues uh, with potassium hydroxide, 10% potassium hydroxide. And some people also use uh, NaOH, uh, sodium hydroxide. And a few people also, uh, in some studies, we have seen that uh, potassium hydroxide is, is used as a warm solution, maybe 40 to 45 degrees Celsius. And the time duration that uh, can be reduced. Usually, uh, we use 10% KOH, uh, the duration in which we, uh, the genitalia, female genitalia, to dissolve soft tissues, it usually takes about uh, overnight. We usually keep it to overnight. But if the warm solution of KOH is used, uh, the duration can be reduced. And then this is the general morphology. I, can, I think I can skip these parts, but these are very um, common ones. This, uh, the structure is the carapace and the abdomen, which is joined by a very thin uh, structure called the pedicel. And you, have, you have the chelicera, you have the pedipalps, and in the males, the pedipalps are modified into copulatory organs, which store and, and also help in transfer of sperms. Uh, and this is the chelicera. You have the mouth parts here, the, uh, the labium and the maxillae, and this is the sternum. And you have the female genital, uh, the plate here, the vagina, and then this is the abdomen and the spinnerets. And these are the different leg parts, you know, bringing from the trochanter, femur, patella, tibia, metatarsis, and tarsus. And uh, this is the the front view of the jumping spider. Um, typically, we can see the large anterior median eyes, and the anterior lateral eyes. Uh, here and then this region between the uh, chelicerae and the eyes are called this the clypeus is the, uh, the chelicerae here with fangs uh, and then these are the pedipalps it's not very clear in this image but uh, these are the pedipalps of a male and here this row of eyes are called the anterior uh, set of eyes and this these there's the anterior median eye and this is the anterior lateral eye and here, a very small eye we can see here is the posterior median eye, and then a, a slightly larger eye, the posterior lateral eye. And just to have a glimpse of the present scenario of what we know about Indian species diversity of Indian saltisids. So, till date, we have about 268 species that are described and accepted that we know from India, and out of which 165 species, uh, comprising 62%, have been described by foreign authors, uh, mainly from the European uh, uh, regions. And also we have about 103 species uh, comprising 38%, which have been described by Indian authors, the native authors. 
uh, and this is actually very less compared to the other regions, the biodiverse rich uh, regions that we see like Australia, Brazil and China. The, uh, the, the diversity is about, about 500 species are known each from Australia, Brazil and China uh, mentioned in each of these papers that we see. But the Indian diversity is only half, about half of what we know. So since we have different uh, hotspots of biodiversity like the Western Ghats and the Eastern, uh, Northeastern region, and also uh, two other regions that we know, uh, the expected diversity can be more. So, but the present situation in, in, in India, the, of the Indian uh, species that have been described is actually uh, very pathetic, I would rather say. So Prozinsky in 2016, he listed all descriptions of Tikar 26 species, Sadhana 4 species, Biswas and Coworkers 17 species, and either of these two categories, one, the inquiranda, which need further investigation, and doubtful, dubious and doubtful. So these are have been uh, uh, categorized as unrecognizable species. So these cannot be identified unless we uh, go back and see the types, study the types of these species. So this is the present situation of Indian salticids that we see. And then the current data, uh, how many species are known from each state. We have very few numbers appearing, while the highest number of diversity is seen in West Bengal, 90 species. Most of the species were described from this region, uh, Darjeeling, and uh, we have the next most diverse uh, state, uh, Tamil Nadu. So a lot of other species were described either from the uh, Nilgiris uh, and other regions across uh, Tamil Nadu. And we have some states with no species records at all. Uh, this does not mean that there are no species uh, appearing there. Even in the Northeast, these are very less explored places and we don't have any sp uh, specific studies focusing on salt acids and the species that were described from these particular regions. So this is just a glimpse of uh, the overall diversity that we know right now. And uh, the species that are known by both sexes, both males and females are 133. And uh, the species known by only one sex, either males or females. And uh, you know, this, this number shows only for females, known by females are 79. And species known only by males are 44. And there is one species which is known only from the juveniles. Uh, this data is up to August 2019, and this data does not include species that have been recorded in diversity studies, uh, which have been uh, identified by non-taxonomists, because there is a lot of uh, misidentification problems. Uh, recently, uh, a recent work in Australia, uh, ecological work uh, from Australia. So these specimens that were identified by ecologists and other workers, they have been checked by uh, rechecked because these specimens were uh, deposited in, an, in a museum so that the taxonomists could check those specimens. And most of the specimens were actually misidentified. So uh, it is very hard for a non taxonomist actually to uh, clearly identify a species. So most of the species records of diversity studies have not been included in this uh, analysis the stats here. So there are a few uh, recent studies that have uh, that we have uh, rediscovered a lot of species and, uh, and new genera that have been identified from India. So Chrysilla volupe, uh, it was discovered after 135 years, uh, Calvin Mathai 2014, uh, recorded after a century. And you have uh, Prozinsky uh, diatrita after 112 years and Curubis erratica, 114 years, Peranthus decorus, 122 years, and uh, and we have some newly recorded genera like Languroditus from Africa. This is mostly African, but this was recently um, discovered from uh, the western coast of India. And you have Mongrus, which is mostly African and uh, Paleartic, and this was uh, discovered from Rajasthan, recorded from Rajasthan. And we have one uh, genus Coltus which was uh, mostly oriental. We have recorded one species from the Northeast India, uh, Assam state. And we have another uh, very recent publication, Vasumatari et al, 2020. We have um, identified this genera, uh, this genus from Assam. 
so these are very poorly known genera uh, namely curubis chrysilla valima uh, valimia and uh, pyranthus so all of these genera the conspecific sexes uh, the this genus was known only by the male the curubis genus most of the other species that were described uh, even the type species uh, they were only known based on the males and no female was known after 114 years we have described the female for the first time uh, we collected both males and females uh, from south india in chennai and we've been able to describe the female for the first time of this genus and uh, similar is chrysilla uh, after 139 years the, the female was described for the first time uh, very recently uh, in 2018 so this genus was also mostly uh, known based on uh, the males and uh, the type species and even the species that is known presently from india chrysilla uh, volupe is actually known uh, was was known for a long time only based on the males so after 139 years we were able to uh, discover both males and females and then describe it for the first time after uh, most 139 years and we have wylemia uh, this genus that we recently uh, discovered from india so the even this genus had very uh, few species say four or five species known from the oriental region but even this uh, all of them were known only from the males so there were no uh, females that were described no conspecies that were collected together both males and females were not collected together so they were not able to describe this but for the first time in 113 years we were able to describe the first female of this genus and recently uh, uh, dr madison and the people from south india from kerala lafen uh, so then uh, and dr sudhi kumar these people have described the male of pyranthus for the first time uh, after 125 years this genus was more not only based on the females uh, but now uh, the male was described for the first time so all these genera are very poorly known and the conspecific uh, sexes were discovered for a very long time so recent studies have added very valuable information uh, to our knowledge of indian diversity there are a lot of uh, uh, the diversity that is yet to be studied and a lot of species that need to be discovered so what does this indicate so this leads to two questions the first one are these species in india really rare and or is the indian species diversity interestingly less so these two questions pop up when we uh, see that the Indian diversity is very less compared to other biodiverse regions. So the answer is uh, we have four hotspots of biodiversity, the Western Ghats, the Himalayas, especially the Eastern Himalayas, and then the Northeast, Northeastern region, uh, including the Indo-Burma hotspot. And then we have Nicobar Islands, which is a part of the Sunderland. So these hotspots of biodiversity have been uh, very less explored and we know very little about Indian diversity. So the exact answer is we have neglected the study of our own fauna. So we need to increase the amount of surveys that we do in our land. And there's a lot of uh, empty spaces uh, that we see across India, a lot of spaces that need to be covered. Uh, there, there have been no surveys for a long time that have not been conducted across India. So once this, these gaps are filled, a lot of species can be uh, recognized. So, so coming to systematics and taxonomy. So systematics includes the study of the process of evolution and phylogeny. So taxonomy is a subdivision of systematics, which consists of three associated activities, namely the, you know, the first one, identification, identifying species that have already been described, and then classifying and naming uh, classification and then the naming part, nomenclature. So we have established guidelines for the process. So going to the classification. So this is the most recent classification that was published by Dr. Wayne Madison, a phylogenetic classification of jumping spiders uh, of the world. And uh, these are the classification system that we can see in uh, India. Uh, we have the subfamilies, these subfamilies uh, five subfamilies that we see, and then the tribes within each of these subfamilies, and then we have these subtribes. This is 
just an outline of the classification of Indian salt acids. So I've just adapted from the original classification that uh, Dr. Madison has um, published. And the same system can also be uh, found in Dr. Jerzy Prasinski's uh, database. Uh, so he has, uh, as we can see here, Madison's alternative classification. So he's given the introduction and uh, each of the tribes, subtribes, and even subfamilies. If you get, just get click on the tabs, you can just directly go into the, uh, the genera list of genera and also uh, the species that are present. So you can directly have a uh, pictorial comparison of the species, the diagnostic illustrations of species side by side, which will enable and help a direct comparison uh, either closely related species that are present in a particular group. So going to identification, we have, uh, we need to uh, photograph spiders in three different, uh, three standard views. The first one is the dorsal view and the lateral view uh, showing the lateral side of the spiders and then the front view showing the, uh, the face. And the, uh, most of the cases, we also can see the, the color patterns of the legs. And there are a few species which have interesting patterns on the legs on the first, first leg and uh, these photographs will be helpful to uh, study in detail uh, the color patterns of species. And uh, the most important character for identification of a species is the genitalia, the male palp. Usually they dissect the male uh, left palp and then take images in two standard views, the ventral view and the retrolateral views. I'll be showing these, uh, some of the views in the later slides. And then the epigyne, the female genitalia and ventral and dorsal views. So usually when we are trying to identify a species, we compare it with already described species uh, which have diagnostic keys, either keys or else if you don't have keys, diagnostic drawings are available. And most of these are found in taxonomic papers that, uh, in which the species were originally described. But uh, there are also catalogs and also databases, online databases like the one maintained by Dr. Prasinski and also by uh, Hiko Metzner, uh, uh, these people, I'll show you those uh, uh, in, a, in, in a later point of time. So adult males and females can be identified up to species level with the help of taxonomy keys and catalogs and diagnostic drawings uh, to be compared in detail and then can be identified. So taxonomy characters are those characters which are used to distinguish between closely related species and uh, so this depends mostly on the general morphology, uh, say the color pattern of the species and also the genital morphology of the species. The male and female genitalia of, the, of, of a particular species is very important in identifying the, uh, the species level identification. Of, uh, and then we have cryptic species, those species which are hard to tell apart based just on morphological data alone, they might uh, they might appear like uh, those are variations of a, a species or like uh, you have color uh, variations and body variations. So there are a few species which are very cryptic and very hard to tell apart. So these species probably require additional tools like DNA barcoding and the molecular uh, supporting tools which can help uh, either to distinguish between uh, different forms and the eyes of a tax, taxonomist are uh, a trained set of eyes which will be able to uh, readily distinguish or readily identify uh, if the species is already described. Uh, it also depends on memory uh, of species that a taxonomist already knows. So this is just like a catalog of books in the library. You have, uh, you know what species, what books you already have and based on that you compare uh, based on diagnostic drawings and literature that is already available. And taxonomic characters and distinguishing species also depends on the degree of variation that uh, each group possesses. So for some groups, there are uh, characters which are very subtle and maybe they, they appear as very simple variations, uh, but those are very important characters which distinguish them as two different species. But there are also a few uh, uh, variations uh, that some in some species where which are commonly found across uh, various geographic regions. 
So these have a lot of variations and those may be intraspecific variations. So a taxonomist has to decide what is the degree of variation uh, in the acceptable limits to distinguish two different species. So we have identification by color patterns, as you can see here, we have uh, Maratus species, uh, peacock spiders, which are endemic. We have adapted these images from uh, Dr. Roberto uh, and Hill's uh, recent publication. And uh, as you can see, there are three distinct species uh, of males, one, two, and three in these three rows. And identification by color pattern is good for regional keys uh, when the, uh, the species are well studied, thoroughly studied species. So these can be relied on, but these are not reliable for all species groups. And this is very important for Maratus, especially because uh, the females of, the, uh, of all these species are mostly indistinguishable. So uh, because uh, they're all, the, most of the other species, they look very similar, uh, either in genitalia or body forms, the females look very similar. Only the males have good color patterns with which they, uh, they, we can identify species. So even the male pouts of most of the Maratus species are uh, uh, look very similar uh, in uh, general morphology, with even the male palps, which make them very hard to distinguish even based on um, just the genitalia alone. But color pattern plays a very important role in, in these forms. And uh, there are a few exceptions where, yes, uh, uh, species can be identified both based on male palps and female genitalia also in these forms. But uh, we need a combination of characters, as you can see here. Identification by genitalia and the general color pattern. And then uh, here you can see uh, there's one species, Tenerius lesseti. Uh, the male is uh, illustrated completely here in the dorsal, lateral, and the frontal view. And the same has been done for the female. And also another uh, sympatric species that we found uh, the Madras Christian College campus, uh, Stenerulus metallicus, which was very recently described. So this is another species, both live together in the same habitat. And uh, um, this is the male and the female. So all of these have been taken, uh, the images have been taken in the standard views, the dorsal, the lateral, and the frontal. And we were able to directly compare how the patterns are different from, for each of these species, both males and females. And then uh, you have the genitalia, we have the diagnostic drawings here for the male palp and the female genitalia. So based on a combination of characters, uh, the identification of a species becomes more robust. Uh, instead of taking uh, one single character and saying, yes, there is a spot on the, you know, the abdomen. Uh, and there, is, there are no spots on the abdomen, uh, let's say. For these two species, yes, it is very easy, uh, at least based on color pattern, yes. And then the males do not have this very, uh, uh, colorful frontal um, clypeus. So at least based on these characters, yes, we are able to distinguish between these two species. But there are a few species which uh, we will not be able to identify at least uh, based on color pattern alone. In those cases, genitalia plays a very important role. And uh, when we use a combination of characters as we see here, the identification becomes more robust. It, it becomes more reliable. And uh, there are a few characters which are very important to the embolus here uh, that are, uh, as you can see in the male palp, and here this retrolateral tibial apophysis uh, protrusion on the uh, uh, palpal tibia. And, and also you find various other uh, protrusions even on the, uh, the tegulum here, and there is no protrusion here in this species. And then you have this uh, RTA that is curving towards the dorsal side, and this one coming anterior. So these characters uh, support the identification of the species. And also um, we have female genitalia here, a large spermatica which stores sperms. And you have the openings here which and the ducts leading to the spermatica. And here this species has two chambers and where these species have only single chamber. So based on this we were able to distinguish between these two species. But these also uh, these characters also play a very important role in identifying a lot of other species when we are uh, trying to study a study the diversity of a larger uh, region. So I have a few examples here. We'll just skim through a few examples. 
uh, uh, there are two different uh, shortfalls that we see, uh, Linnean shortfall and the Wallachian's shortfall. The Linnean shortfall refers to the, uh, the diversity that is very less studied, the species that have been described, uh, almost 80, 80 to 85 percent of the Earth's diversity has not been explored in, and that, uh, most of the species have been undescribed. So that is the Linnean uh, shortfall. And uh, the other shortfall is the Wallachian shortfall, where we don't have enough distributional data, even when a species is described. We have only one or two, uh, uh, the data is very uh, scarce, and we don't have the proper distributional data for each of the species that we uh, encounter. So even the distributional data is very scarce. So this is the Wallachian shortfall. So this is an example of Wallachian shortfall. Uh, this species, Chrysilla volume, was uh, first described from Sri Lanka in 1879. And after uh, almost approximately about 100 years later, it was uh, recorded from Bhutan by Dr. Zabka in 1985. Uh, but the whole of the Indian subcontinent, we didn't have any records of this particular species throughout India. It was found originally described from Sri Lanka, and then after uh, uh, 100 years, it was discovered from uh, Bhutan, and there, are, there were no records at all. So recently, in 2014, I was able to uh, record this species from Chennai, uh, Madras, the Madras Christian College campus, where most of my work was done. So, and there were a lot of other uh, photographic records that we were able to see from one from Uttarakhand and one from Hyderabad and Telangana, and then a few uh, records from uh, Maharashtra and then Karnataka and Kerala. There were a lot of uh, images that were coming up in the social media, of uh, these species, mostly of males, and uh, the females were literally unknown. So I was able to uh, collect male and female together, uh, males and females together, from Chennai and uh, based on input, inputs from uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Radhya Sanab, he uh, also uh, collected a few uh, samples from uh, Mumbai, um, these regions uh, near Mumbai. And he was able to, um, uh, based on these, we were able to match the males and females. As you can see, the females here have a little bit of variations from different locations, but at least based on uh, the male pattern and also the genitalia, we were able to uh, say that these two were the same species, these two forms were the same species. And uh, so we got uh, new records of the species from Chennai, from Tamil Nadu, from Kerala, from Karnataka, Maharashtra, Gujarat, uh, Telangana, West Bengal, and Uttarakhand. So we were able to cover almost a part of India where the species was recorded. and. Uh, we are expecting uh, these species could be found even in these regions, but uh, upon more studies, we were able to find uh, a lot of other uh, distributional data for this particular species. So this is a perfect example of Wallachian shortfall where uh, there was very less uh, data about distribution for almost more than over a century. And then through recent studies, we were able to gather much data and then partially fulfill um, the data, the shortfall. And the next example is Piranthus decorus. Uh, this species was originally described from Myanmar. Uh, this is the type locality, Tarawadi. Uh, this was described from here and it was also recorded from here in the original description. So these uh, two specimens were uh, actually described. And then uh, after 122 years, we were able to uh, identify the same species from Maharashtra in this location. And we were able to identify with the help of Dr. Madison, uh, uh, the species belong to this genus and this particular species. Um, and then, so this is the illustration of our species that we uh, uh, dissected is the female genitalia. And this is the external structure, how it looks and the internal structures. So after clearing, we'll be able to see all the internal structures very clearly. So, and this is the drawing uh, that Dr. Prozinski had then drawn of the type that was uh, deposited in the European museums. So we were able to clearly identify the species, even though it was known only from the original description and the, uh, the very, the drawing of Dr. Prozinski. Mm -hmm. So 
very strikingly similar and we were able to identify this. So after, uh, so recent studies have also uh, uh, shown that the diversity of the species is even, uh, we have described uh, from Western Guards, one more species from the Western Guards was described very recently and the male was also uh, described. And this is another example of uh, Asimonia cristata, where this species was described from the same location. Again, Tharawadi Thoral had described the species in 1895, and uh, he described the males as a uh, the males as a different species and the females as a uh, another species. So, uh, A. picta and A. cristata both were described from Tharawadi, and. Uh, Although he described male as a separate species and the female as a separate species, Thoral and both Wanlis in 1980 doubted if these could be the same species, the males and females of the same species. So this could not be verified for over 100 years. And after 121 years, uh, both these sexes was coll were collected together from Kerala. Uh, Sudhan et al. Uh, recently reported on this. So uh, both males and females were collected together and were described and it was found that male and female of Picta and Cristeta were actually the same species. And then we have uh, Plexicopus clemens. Uh, this species was uh, very recently I, uh, discovered from India. So this was actually known from African countries uh, uh, and the Arabian countries and also a few countries from Central Asia. And this was uh, recently recorded from South India, Bangalore. I was just walking through a very small stretch of grassy path and I was just looking down and I found a single specimen. I thought at first that this could be Plexippus P2C and I just casually put it into my bag and then went back. So after I decided to take a few photographs and make a detailed comparison of that and then I found that the genitalia of this particular species did not uh, match both with uh, Lexippus peter or Pekuli, the commonly found species in India. Uh, and those are cosmotropical species. And uh, I at first thought that I had broken the embolus, this tip, because more, both the species has a very fine tip. Uh, and I thought I had broken the embolus tip here. And I checked the, uh, the other pulp, the right pulp, and both pulps were similar. So these have these the structure was very similar, and I started looking for literature of other known flexible species that were described from other parts of uh, the world, especially from Central Asia and uh, the other regions, even from China and the Oriental regions. So uh, I was able to identify the species uh, very clearly based on the palpal morphology, and then uh, establish its identity. So this species that, is, that was already known from this region, both African and uh, Central Asian region, was discovered from India. And we have another uh, interesting species, Neobritus tibialis, which was uh, described in Bhutan. And they were all the specimens that were collected from uh, Southeast Asian region, the Malaysia, Borneo. And uh, this species was recently discovered from uh, uh, West Bengal, Calcutta, and it was reported by Banerjee, Indranil Banerjee at all. And uh, we have uh, good, uh, good supporting. Uh, at first, this was identified up to the genus level, and uh, it was just mentioned as Neobritus species, the uh, Neobritus gene uh, species, uh, and the identity of the species was unknown. So, in order to identify the species, yes, we had to uh, check the genitalia, we had to see study and these are uh, comparative uh, drawings that were adapted from Dr. Prozinski's paper, original paper and these perfectly match and it was later confirmed that it was the same species and yes the female also looks like this and uh, these are drawings from Dr. Wanless, Fred Wanless from uh, Malaysia and these are drawings from Dr. Krista Dielman and our uh, this is the image of a specimen that we got from West Bengal. And distinguished between very closely related species, we have Aishas kumariae and Aishas vikramatrai. Uh, 
this is Aishis Kumari and this is Aishis Vikramatrai. Based on the general morphology, they almost look very similar, uh, but here is one white spot, a patch of white hairs or setae, uh, as you can see in this particular species, whereas we don't have any uh, particular spots there. And this also must be supported by the genital morphology. And we have uh, both side by side here of Aishas Kumari and uh, Aishas Vikram Matrai, both males and females. So we have particular characters, the shape of the embolus here, the shape of the embolus here, the protrusion of the bulbous, the posterior protrusion of this species is different from uh, this species. And again, you have uh, clear pocket-like uh, pockets here uh, along the uh, posterior margin of the epigenome where pockets are not there in this, place, in this species. So this species of uh, Aishas Kumaria was discovered from both from Chennai and from Bangalore and the other species was described from Kerala. And this is another example uh, where uh, variations occur. Uh, Jazigo Sunilimai, which was recently described from uh, uh, Mumbai region. And uh, as you can see, uh, there are differences between these two. Uh, these are two different specimens. The, the genitalia of two different specimens. There are very uh, there are a few variations, as you can see, which may uh, lead to some people thinking that these may be two different uh, distinct species, because uh, but there are some asymmetric uh, there are some asymmetric uh, characters that we can see even from the left from the left to the right side, but the ground plan remains the same in both these specimens. So it was eventually uh, recognized as the same species because we also had males uh, collected together and we were able to uh, identify them both as the same species. And there are a few other examples that I would like to share. Uh, one from Carl Hutt is with us. Uh, these were described under different names uh, from India. One, Lexippus Gajbe, uh, Marpisa Decorata, Marpisa Lakshmi Kanthpurensis, and Marpisa Tikadari. I was able to recently uh, study all of these spe spe the species, and uh, these were later recognized as uh, Carhartus bitters based on both uh, the color pattern and also the genital morphology. And uh, these three species, Marpisa Decorata, Lakshmi Kanthpurensis, and uh, Tikadari, were described from uh, Calcutta and surrounding regions. And from very closely, um, uh, closely uh, close locations, as you can see here in the map, uh, this is Marpisa decorata, Marpisa ticadari, and here Marpisa lakshmikant uh, forensis. Uh, this is the insect from the region from here. So these all three were described as three distinct species uh, based only on females again by three different authors. Uh, they were interpreted as different species. Uh, but recent studies, uh, we were able to uh, record the species from different locations across India, uh, both from Northeast India, and, uh, the Eastern Himalayas, West Bengal, and uh, other regions across the coastal regions across India. And there are two distinct species uh, that we were able to recognize, Carhartus vidis and Silindi. Uh, this was also recently described as a uh, new species. So the first row, this represents uh, the male and female of Carhartus with this. And uh, these are images of the preserved specimen. That were preserved specimen images are also very important because uh, after a certain point of time, the color uh, pattern of that, uh, the scales lose colors. And uh, the pattern of uh, color pattern usually fades off and the original color as you can see in life is not usually seen after the preservation and the same goes good for the other species also here and this is the female uh, as you can see this has good bronze uh, metallic colors and the preserved specimen whereas does not have any tinge of green as you can see here it has become reddish brown so after preservation uh, the color usually fades off uh, 
but these two species were again sympatric found in the same habitat and same environment in the Madras Christian College campus. Although this species is found uh, in many other locations across India and Southeast Asia also, uh, this particular species was found uh, living together uh, here in uh, uh, Chennai, South India. And we have very subtle differences of the male palp, which I was unable to like recognize whether if it was a distinct species at all, even though the uh, pattern of uh, these species uh, clearly do not match at all. Uh, say for the females, here you have two distinct uh, longitudinal patches of white, as you can see here. And this does not have a longitudinal patch of white. Here you have a U-shaped white patch and a black patch here. And then uh, the males are also uh, having a very similar pattern as the, as the female. But the male of Carhartus widus has a very distinct pattern again, two longitudinal patches on the carapace and also on the abdomen. Whereas this uh, male do not have, does not have a similar pattern. It appears very different. And here in the males, when I was able to uh, see it uh, under the norm microscope, I was not able to like very easily distinguish uh, between these two species. I thought maybe these are variations, local variations or uh, among, among the species. So here, as I've pointed out here, there is a distinct bulge, whereas this does not have a bulge here. And here, uh, the RTA is more uh, like claw-shaped or hook-shaped, whereas it is uh, very distinct here. It does not have that much of a, a curvature here. And again, these are the parts. And again, when I compared the females, here, uh, it had copulatory ducts that were rising up from these spermatheca, uh, both were parallel. And then here you have the uh, copulatory openings that were present almost on the posterior side, whereas here it was on the anterior region. So these differences uh, were enough to separate them as two distinct species. And uh, comparing Carhartus Assam, Assam and Carhartus Unanensis, uh, even Assam, this species was recently described uh, as a distinct species very recently, uh, uh, earlier this year. And these both species have very subtle differences. Uh, the differences in the orientation of the retrolateral tibial apophysis. All the other parts uh, almost look very similar between these two species, except for the, uh, the length of the symbium and the length of the uh, valval tibia. And these proportions are different. And then uh, the angle at which the RTA is protruding is also different in these two cases. Uh, at first, even this species I thought could be a variation of maybe uh, a very close related species, which I was unable to, um, to suffer for a, quite some time uh, until upon very uh, detailed examination, I was able to recognize the other uh, proportions and the differences in the angles of RTA also. And more, in most of cases, there are species, uh, for example, say, uh, I first discovered the species in 2010. I photographed it and I was unable to establish its identity until I uh, was able to study a few other types, establish the identity of how Carhartus vitus really looks like. And then uh, um, when I studied the types of the other Marpisa species, of Indian species that were described as different species, uh, which were actually Carhartus vitus, then I was able to do, uh, it took about uh, nine years for me to uh, arrive at this conclusion. And there are a lot of other examples also where, uh, in like I said, Dr. Kronsted from the Sweden uh, Museum, he described uh, Vadikosa gattica species, and it took about uh, more than 20 years for him to, uh, it usually takes taxonomy, usually takes a lot of time because uh, we look for a lot of uh, supporting characters, uh, support, uh, specimens, a lot of other specimens that we need, uh, lack of specimens, lack of data, and that uh, drags on the time for a particular long time. And even uh, in parasites, Dr. Peter Yager, he described a few African uh, new uh, genera recently. And even him, uh, he mentioned that it took about like 15 years. Uh, sometimes it, it is a long wait. And then some misplaced species also cause uh, 
taxonomic confusions like earlier case in Carhartus vitus, we saw that uh, other species that were placed in Marpisa were actually Carhartus. And this particular species that was described was actually Marpisa uh, arumbagensis. Based on the uh, original drawing, I was able to recognize like or uh, guess that this could probably be a uh, species that belong to uh, Stenia uh, but uh, I was unable to decide if that species could really be the same in Stenia or not until we were able to uh, examine the type of that particular species. And even in this uh, special case, only the females uh, were illustrated where the male, uh, the verbal descriptions were not sufficient enough for us to identify the species. Only the female was uh, illustrated and uh, this is the holotype female, the image of the same that was illustrated here. And there are a few uh, mismatches also uh, while illustrating species as you can see, uh, which also may lead to confusions, uh, at least based on uh, labels we were able to recognize yes this is the holotype and yes this is the same species that the author has described and we were able to describe and illustrate the male also for the first time and uh, during that process we were able to recognize that the another species Tenerilis digitus which was recently described as a new species from Gujarat here in western India and this species was actually described Marpis aramagensis from eastern India in Chandur forest in uh, West Bengal so these are from the opposite uh, corners of India, east and west, and uh, one might easily uh, suggest that these may be two distinct species. So once we were able to um, see a few, study a few uh, specimens from Andhra Pradesh, also from Maharashtra, and uh, this particular species, and this uh, Marpis armagensis from West Bengal, we were able to say that yes, all these belong to the same species. And there is also a wide gap uh the rest of the parts of india that need to be studied where there is a lot of shortfall the volition shortfall as we can see uh the data for indian species the distributional data for this particular species is um, incomplete so there is a possibility of uh, uh, finding this species in other parts of india also so later on this species was uh, digitus was synonymized with Mapisaran Martensis, and this was transferred to this particular genus. So misplaced species uh, are a great cause of concern and they cause a lot of taxonomic confusion. So a lot of other uh, taxonomic problems in general, as we can see, sexual dimorphism, males and females have been uh, described as two distinct spe species uh, because they look very uh, different sometimes, or even after of the same species. So sexual dimorphism between males and females, yes, uh, they are found in various varying degrees across very uh, different groups of spiders. Uh, some have very similar males and females where some uh, have very distinct, uh, oddly looking, different looking males and females. And uh, immature forms, well, we are unable to recognize immature forms uh, because uh, taxonomy or, uh, heavily depends on the the morphology of the genitalia. So only uh, immature forms don't have mature uh, the genitalia developed. So again, poor and inadequate descriptions. Most of the previous descriptions that we have, like uh, the century old workers that have already described, all those descriptions are outdated. And those are mostly characters which are not presently used for model taxonomy. And uh, those are very poor. Some of them have not been illustrated at all. So these species cannot be identified uh, in the modern sense. And then uh, we have very poor state of preservation for some species, where some species are lost, uh, types of some species are lost and uh, destroyed. And some species have been, uh, specimens have been damaged. Some, uh, I'll discuss uh, this in the further slides. So inadequately surveyed in diverse Indian landscape. So this is another very important uh, uh, area that has to be covered, where uh, a lot of Indian landscape has to be covered and only then we will be able to at least have a very basic idea of how many uh, species, the diversity of Indian species. 
and then the lack of molecular data. This, uh, as um, recently, a lot of studies have been including molecular data, and uh, these studies are slowly gaining uh, momentum recently. And then most of Indian forms do not have molecular data at all, at least. Uh, out of the 268 species that we know, well, maybe only 20 species have molecular data, like DNA barcodes attached to them, to their names, and the importance of type or voucher specimens. So in the first uh, two images, uh, this is a very well-preserved specimen. This was uh, described in 1915 by Narayan Omar and this species, was recently photographed after 100 years in 2017. And this uh, specimen was described as another species from Sri Lanka, Birbarakni Aurantika, Benjamin, 2015. But uh, since he was unable to study the types from the Zoological Survey of India, so he described them as a, described, uh, as a distinct species uh, in 2015 after 100 years exactly. So these two have were described as two distinct species. One, this was from Madras, South India, and this was from Sri Lanka. So we have a very well preserved specimen and uh, which uh, looks very uh, strikingly similar to the, um, the recent uh, specimen that was caught very recently. So uh, this was later synonymized uh, in 2017 by Caleb and Benjamin together when we found that these two uh, represented the same species. Uh, we also study the genitalia to come confirm this. And then this is one good example of uh, a well-preserved specimen. This has been very well preserved for over 100 years. And then you have partially damaged specimens where legs are broken, or sometimes even the abdomen is separated from the canopies. Uh, the all the other segments of the legs or the palps are broken. Uh, but at least uh, these are partially in a good form. And then we have desiccated specimens where, uh, where the alcohol dries out and then there is no care given to the specimens. And these, there are a few samples uh, in most of the collections, as you can see, uh, when you study museum samples, yes, when there are no curators taking care of the collections where there are no special, uh, specialized per persons working in collections, you find samples uh, drying out because wet collections need constant refilling of uh, preservative. And then we have decomposed specimens. After these specimens dry out, there are some possibilities of fungal in, uh, you know, fungus getting infected. And then the samples, they leach out the samples. And sometimes even when uh, the specimen is poorly preserved, uh, these samples start to decompose and the samples are degraded. And then we have uh, specimens which are destroyed either in fire or war. And, uh, also, some uh, museums were destroyed during the Second World War in the European uh, part of the world. And then we have recent uh, examples of fire uh, that have destroyed the Brazilian Natural History Museum. Uh, so there are a few samples. Yes, there were a lot of species that were preserved in the particular collection that was destroyed by fire. And then there are also uh, species or specimens that are misplaced or lost. And then we have phantom types. Uh, this, I have um, uh, made this term for species where a person or an author describes a particular species and they have not uh, deposited any types. So there is no specific type for that particular species. So that means there are no specimens available in the museum. Uh, and then we also have, uh, in continuation from the, uh, the previous slide, we have the importance of uh, collections. So this is one very good example of uh, uh, specimens that were very beautifully preserved after 100 years. These were collected in 1916 by Dr. Frederick Henry Gravely. And he worked as an assistant superintendent of the Indian Museum, Calcutta, and then later he moved to Madras, 1920. And he worked on the uh, arachnid fauna. He described a lot of uranium moths and myelomorphs also. So he has collected a few species uh, from like, uh, West Bengal to the Darjeeling region. And some solticids which were undescribed, I've been able to uh, uh, examine those uh, specimens and describe them. Both of them are uh, a new genus and a new species. This was actually described under British, but was recently uh, uh, 
uh, moved to a new genus. Um, Chinese authors have recently discovered another species from China. Both they have found both males and females together, so they were able to uh, describe it as a new genus. Now, back then, when I described the species, I was unable to uh, uh, like place it confidently in a new genus because we lack data of the females, uh, how the female genitalia look like. And here is another species, Indopadilla Darjeeling, that we recently described from the same region. So these were collected by Gramley in you know, 1916. And these two species were described in 2018 and 19, respectively. So museums hold a lot of pressures, a lot of undescribed species. Uh, sometimes what happens is the, uh, the original uh, locations, the habitats of these particular species may be lost over, over time and they may be converted into uh, building complexes or some other, uh, something might, might have happened where the habitat must have been lost. So uh, these collections uh, hold all these specimens, these species, which may also have become extinct because due to various other reasons, uh, but these species may not be found now, but yes, we need proper surveys again uh, to in the, from the same region to confirm if the species do really exist there or not, and uh, what is the exact uh, extent to which the species is suffering. And uh, moving on to the barcoding, the most modern techniques uh, for the application of modern techniques that we uh, see. Uh, two different jumping spiders uh, that were recently described from uh, Rajasthan. Posila Sirohi and Mogras Rajasthan and says both of them were barcoded uh, and from in both cases a single leg was taken and then uh, DNA was amplified and then uh, submitted to NCBI. So this uh, DNA data, the molecular data, the barcode will be helpful for further uh, supporting data where close related, related species can also be barcoded and then compared if morphology is not enough to uh, substantiate if both species may be different or not. So in those cases, yes, DNA barcoding will be of help to, uh, will be a supporting tool. And there are also a few examples. Uh, one example is for matching sexes, DNA barcoding, which helps. So this, these two species, Fintilla uh, lucai and Quilpipomis, were described from uh, Vietnam in 1985 by Dr. Zabka. So these two type localities were 80 kilometers apart. So one is the, one was based on the male Aquiformis and Lucas was described based on the female. So recent work in 2016, they have been able to correct both males and females, which were, yes, eventually identified as two distinct species. But uh, since both the males and the females were collected together from the same habitat and they have similar body pattern and the DNA barcoding also revealed that all of them fell into the same clade both species uh, which uh, fell into the same identified morphologically identified as two distinct species fell into the same clade and this was also uh, a supporting uh, tool to say that yes both the male and the female of these two species in fact belong to the same species and here is another example where uh, DNA barcoding helps uh, these are two distinct species yes the darker form and, and this species, uh, which has a pattern, yellowish pattern, a lighter form. These are from two distinct locations, uh, far apart locations, but with similar, very similar looking genitalia. Here, this uh, Chalco strictus sinevi, uh, and then Grishkane. So the males and as well as the females are looking very similar. The genitalia looks very similar, but uh, this was this study was uh, made by Dr. Sick at all, and then we have the DNA data coming into play where each of the species, the charcoal uh, species, uh, fell into monophyletic clades. And we have good supporting values with which they were able to say, Yes, they, those were two distinct species and separated geographically also. So these two populations located from two dis uh, different locations, far locations. Uh, they had different size and uh, pattern, color patterns, but uh, even though they had very similar genitalia, these species were well supported uh, with monophyletic clades uh, forming for each of the species. And then uh, they also mentioned a very similar example where Euphorus species that they have 
also Bakur here, Fontal is a flower uh, indistinguishable, indistinguishable in shape of the uh, genitalia, but they differ in color pattern. So these were uh, also supported there. The identification was also supported by uh, the DNA barcoding data. And even for the DNA barcoding data, there are very few, uh, uh, very little data that we have. Uh, for example, Maratus, uh, peacock spiders, uh, spiders from endemic to, the Austra to Australia. So this genus has 81 species, uh, 81 valid species. Uh, this uh, was, was in 2018, I guess. And then, but we have only four sequences that uh, of uh, cytochrome C oxidase one that were uh, uh, found on old database. So the morphology, uh, based on morphology, we have 81 species, and um, I think more species have been added recently uh, from Australia from recent workers. Uh, Michael Schubert has uh, uh, described a few species. At, uh, maybe a nine or 10 species. And then, uh, but the uh, DNA barcode data is very little where we have only four uh, species and even more all those species uh, have not been identified to the species level. They have just been left at the genus level. So the, the molecular data that we have is very uh, uh, less and uh, unreliable right now until a robust uh, library gets built. And then we will be able to identify a lot of other species until both morphology and the molecular data should correlate. And uh, moving on to the next uh, aspect, natural history observations. So recently we were able to uh, uh, record the uh, egg laying, uh, uh, the development, development of uh, eggs from Chrysilla volume, uh, the species. And these photographs were taken by uh, our colleague, Mr. Rajesh Sanap, has beautifully taken uh, images of the development of the eggs. Uh, this is until the first in star of uh, this particular species, and we were able to move on to the next level. Uh, and this species, uh, Jerzyga sunilamai, which, which was also described recently from Maharashtra, and uh, here he has uh, the same person, Dr. Mr. Sanap, has uh, uh, taken beautiful images of the male approaching the female uh, and the courtship behavior and how it mates uh, the sequences uh, 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 provided here. And also of egg laying, egg sac construction and how the female lays eggs and what kind of a silken retreat is being made. And uh, these are of the uh, instars that are being found after a certain point of time. And this is the uh, female that was uh, found near the egg sac. And uh, these are images of the embryonic and post-embryonic development of the same eggs. And then uh, this is until the first instar. And this is to the first instar and these after a few days of more maturation. And uh, these are also record shots of the habitat, how the habitat looks like and uh, how the species lives in the environment, what kind of uh, uh, cocoons or uh, sacs, egg sacs, or, uh, where they live. And then here is the specimen in comparison to a small rock and then how it makes silken retreats. And here it is feeding on fly. And there are more recent works uh, that have been uh, on natural history observations, uh, molting, uh, male female interactions, brooding by Telomonia diminuta, and then predation and then ecological uh, observations, sticky, sticky floral stems and jumping spiders, how they interact. And then we have uh, the exact construction of a species, Cochalus, and then brooding behavior, mating and filial ophagy, which was recorded photographically in uh, Neobritus. And then we have uh, the studies on the impact of brood, parasitoids and ophagy on survival. And then we have construction of orb webs as nocturnal retreats, which was also recently uh, described in 2019 by Hillerton. We have other uh, Ufeji by Halasemic uh, Cuprius and also a tadpole predation by a jumping spider. These are most recent works and there are a lot of photographic records that have also been coming up uh, in several cases and the studies on natural history observations of jumping spiders and other spiders have also been increasing and these are very valuable observations because nothing is literally known for Indian spiders. And uh, coming to field guides, 
uh, reliable field guides can only be based on authentically identified specimens, both uh, uh, based on morphology, general color pattern, and also uh, the genital morphology, unless and until we have uh, a thoroughly studied uh, region, uh, then only we can uh, have field guides simply based on the color patterns, where we will be able to recognize species, at least even uh, if not to the species level, at least to the genus level, yes, we will be able to recognize a few. Uh, this is just an uh, outlook of how a field guide can look, which will be uh, helpful for identifying spiders jumping spiders, at least based on color patterns. And uh, taxonomic resources for in the modern era, where we have digital taxonomic resources, World Spider Catalog has played a very important role in providing all literature, available literature, 100% of the literature is available in PDFs. We have 15,300 odd references, and uh, we have good data. Each uh, species, with all the taxonomic list of taxonomic references that have been given. Just click on the link to the PDF and you'll be able to uh, download the uh, original literature. And also here we have uh, links to the external resources and we also have distribution data on how the, uh, where these species are uh, uh, recorded and found already. So this is one good example of digital taxonomic resources, which also help in uh, uh, fast, uh, exchange of information and also comparison of a lot of uh, data. And here uh, is another example, monograph of the Salter City of the World. This is a database which holds all the pictorial, uh, which gives a pictorial uh, representation, diagnostic illustrations of all the species. Uh, right now, not all species have been updated, but yes, uh, at least well, most of the species are present here. And they offer a guide to identification of the genera. He has made a beautiful uh, presentation. And again, uh, identification of genera by internal structures of uh, epigyne, the external structure of epigyne, and also the body shape and the color pattern, and also based on male genitalia. So uh, Dr. Prosinski's database would be very helpful for beginners. There is a lot of data available uh, in, the website, in the database even for geographic distributions and also the list of species, uh, where the, spe the species have been deposited, where the depository is, a lot of other data can be accessed from this uh, database. And uh, these are screenshots from the database where you have the general morphology of the species, for example, Pristovia heterospina, the male and female uh, genitalia here. And uh, these are other species related species, which you can directly compare uh, and see uh, what is the difference between these two species. And yes, these can be done for all uh, the species also. So these can also be sorted out into different groups and so supergroups or subgroups and subgenus species and different levels. Including, uh, and yes, you can also search a taxon, taxon by tree, such a publication or collection based on geographic uh, distribution and uh, diagnostic drawings. This is another uh, database uh, maintained by Dr. Hiko Metzner, uh, Jumping Spiders of the World. And this also gives a very nice uh, outlook of all the uh, species, the saltisids of the world. We have uh, new editions for 2020 here, you can see, and how many are still there uh, without illustrations. And all this data is there. And then we have uh, other data that is available here and uh, each of the links hold a lot of information. And here you can also, you also have uh, the field guides of uh, different species. You can just directly go to uh, the distribution here, link into the tab here, and then you have India, you can directly go and click on the formal survey or species image or image field guides. There are a lot of uh, problems even here in this uh, database which need to be curated. It's yet to be done, but yes, it gives a good uh, outlook of how a field guide can be there. And then uh, the surveys, it is constantly being updated right now. So these will be of very use, uh, very much of help to the people who are currently interested in salt this area right now. And the way forward. So systematic sampling is required uh, all across India, different habitats, different uh, places that have not been sampled before. Yes, all these uh, we need require systematic sampling. 
and then instead of very random or opportunistic uh, approach of capturing just one or two uh, specimens, most of the time we'll be able to capture only common species uh, and we miss out on the very rare ones. Uh, look for both sexes. Yes, we need to collect both males and females and we constantly keep on observing for a particular species. And then uh, documentation of all these aspects are required. The first one, habitat data, how the habitat is, the general morphology, genitalia morphology, and the DNA barcode, and the life history studies and natural history observations are very important. And these are the way forward for our studies on salt today, especially in um, India. Thank you very much for patiently listening. Thank you, Team Saliga, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. John. It was a very informative and enlightening presentation. Uh, we'll quickly move over to the questions and answer session. We have quite a few questions coming in. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, okay. Aditya Singh Chauhan has asked, uh, how can we cross-check about species information and about their genes? Species information and about their genes. Yes. How can we cross-check about species information and about their genes? Uh, both these data are not uh, parallelly available on, in the same uh, database. But uh, now Bolt is also trying, uh, you know, Bolt database is trying to uh, combine both, actually. So uh, for species identity, you need to uh, just go to the uh, diagnostic illustrations that have been presented either in the uh, Salticity databases, either from Dr. Prozinski or uh, the other one maintained by Dr. Kiko Metzner. And but for molecular aspects, as you require the genetic information, you will have to go to either NCBI or Bold, and you will have to uh, cross check and verify if the same species information is available. Because most of the same uh, species that have been uh, identified, you won't find the same data for the same species available there in the uh, DNA databases. So only if the same species data is available, you will be able to cross verify and then take the data together. Other than that, we don't have other, other options here. Thank you. Uh, Brancus Kalabi has asked, what is the difference between Bavia and Bavia Recta? Uh, that <laughs> is a <laughs> more technical question that would require a detailed study of the original literature. But that was recently, Bavia Recta was recently described from Sri Lanka by Dr. Benjamin and his uh, student. So Bavia is in fact, to study the type species for that uh, because Bavia as a whole right now is a mixture. Uh, it may not be monophyletic. There are a lot of other genera or other species which may need to be separated to other genera. So that the concept has to uh, be revised more. So right now, um, Bavia recta based on the genital morphology and also the color pattern uh, on the carapace and also uh, a few other characters Dr. Benjamin has mentioned so those diagnostic features can be accessed from the original literature there. Jitesh Pai has asked, what's the difference between Valimia and Anarotus? Uh, Anarotus is actually known only from the Oriental region, but yes, there are a few spe uh, specimens photographically identified. Yes, yes, morphologically, uh, they may look very similar. Uh, most of the Indian forms that were identified as anorotus may, in fact, be uh, Wailamia. So that requires, again, a detailed study of the genitalia of each of the specimens that were photographed. They have to be collected uh, and, again, studied under the microscope. We'll have to see this, uh, compare if it is really anorotus or Wailamia. So based on the genitalia, you will be able to uh, clearly distinguish both the species, uh, both of the genus uh, genera and also the species. So for that, if you have to have experiments and then do a detailed work. Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. John, your voice was very low. Yeah, uh, yeah, now it's uh, shall, clear. I, shall I repeat? Uh, no, no, uh, we heard uh, only the voice was low, that's it. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Thomas asks, being an amateur in the field, how does one check if a spider being seen is one worth assessing further for its uh, zoological description. Uh, yes, uh, for photographic database, we have a, a database, again, uh, Dr. Prozinski's database and Dr. Hiko Metzner's database, 
we have good collections of images in general uh, which give the general morphology yeah and the color pattern also yeah, if you uh, photograph a species you can directly compare it with these uh, images that are already, already available and if you don't come across any comparative uh, images yes you might think uh, it may be something interesting or different but again you will have to again collect specimens and do a detailed taxonomic study in order to say that yes it is a distinct species or it is a common species that is already available Mohit Chennai has asked, as citizen scientists, how can individuals contribute in documenting or mapping distribution of salt seeds? Now that more people show interest in spiders than before. Uh, for this is a very important question, I would rather say. Uh, and since a lot of people have been interested in studying salt seeds and not only salt seeds, a lot of other spiders also, uh, uh, doing just photography, and then uh, uh, trying to identify a species right now is not feasible because a lot of species, uh, and, and the identity of a lot of species cannot be verified uh, without examining the genitalia. So in that case, when uh, a species uh, already, if, if there is a species that is already described, uh, like say Chrysler volume, which will be able to, uh, males are easily recognizable based on the pattern, Yes, uh, based on photographic records, we will be able to because that was recently uh, re-described and we have good data to back up uh, even the, uh, the photographic records. So that will be very helpful. But each of these records need to be either uh, put into a compiled database where that can be retrieved for later uh, further uh, study. So all of these observations need to find a particular database where they can be put in so that they can be used for further study. Because right then, if you don't have an answer to say if that is the same species or not, it, it might sometimes take time, as I already mentioned in the, uh, the presentation. Sometimes it takes uh, years and years together to uh, establish the identity of certain species. But for species that all you have data for already, yes, you will be able to give a good uh, outline. Your data will be of very much use. But in case if that data is not readily available, uh, that data can all, always be used later on uh, when more data, uh, comparative data is available. Ashirvat Tripathi asks, can a salt uh, seedologist describe other spider families? Yes, uh, that is possible as long as you have comparative literature uh, that is available uh, because um, for spiders uh, in general, we depend mostly on the, uh, the genitalia for identification of the species. And you already have a lot of uh, literature that is available on the World Spider Catalog. Everything is access accessible. And uh, once you are able to compare all the species together, you will be able to identify other families also. But most of the specialists in Saldacidae, they are confined either to a particular subfamily or a tribe sometimes. When you specialize into some groups, yes, you will be focused mostly on those groups alone. But uh, as a general taxonomist, yes, you will be able to identify other species also of spiders. Jitesh Pai asks, what is the forum you expect one to upload the very distinct spiders that one has photographed? Uh, there are a lot of forums right now. Uh, there are many photographs that are being uploaded on Facebook and different groups. And yes, one by uh, Dr. Prishnamay Kunte, he has also uh, uh, initiated a lot of citizen science, science initiatives. Yes, iNaturalist is there. And a lot of citizen science initiatives, those uh, forums can be um, used. Pavan Kulkarni asks, arthropods are having characteristic feature of Eka disease. What about spiders? No, I, I didn't get you. Could you please repeat? Yeah, arthropods are having characteristics feature of echidasis, E-C-A-D-A-Y-S-I-S. Echidasis, okay. what about spiders? Uh, I might not be able to answer this question right now. No problem. Uh, we, we will reach out to him later. Yes, yes. Uh, Pawan Ramachandra asks, is there any technological advancement which could uh, scan a live specimen as we use CT scan or MRI in case of humans? Uh, yes, for a certain uh, fossil species that has been done for beetles and uh, some other species also, 
and the same can be done for uh, you know, spider species also but that a lot of uh, standardization work needs to be done uh, for that work yes uh, one person with a bengali name uh, asks would you like to make a field guide based on morphology yes uh, before a uh, uh, complete field guide is uh, available right now for us yes uh, that can be done but that requires as i mentioned earlier uh, the uh, the species of that particular uh, geography that area has to be well studied before we can get a reliable field guide until then uh, those species can be uh, identified at least based on the color pattern uh, it can be grouped into uh, uh, certain genera sometimes yes that can be done okay thank you sir that was the last question for the day uh, joseph schubert uh, says rid seq data is in preparation for maratus and most of the species are supported by the molecular data but the presently accepted clades are challenged uh, he is from australia okay it was just a point okay. mentioned by him oh that's nice thank you uh, thank you for the wonderfully detailed information uh, webinar sir we all enjoyed it a lot so one thing is very clear the amount of work which needs to be done on salty seeds and all the other uh, spiders of india is huge is humongous so yeah. very big challenge in front of all of us i'm sure this informative session would have uh, motivated and encouraged few of our uh, participants to take it uh, take this field seriously more seriously and perhaps contribute uh, to this field in their own way and we the people of team saliga will uh, continue to uh, keep doing what we do uh, best that is encourage and uh, create awareness among people and uh, in the mean in the long run perhaps bring up more uh, people in, uh, interested in taxonomy thank you sir thank you for your amazing uh, webinar absolutely thank you very much for the opportunity team yeah our pleasure sir so uh, thank you all we would like to uh, thank all the participants for their time on a sunday evening you know how, how precious sundays are nowadays so thank you all uh, we have uh, two webinars planned for next weekend the details of which will be shared across uh, on all the facebook forums thank you and with this we would like to wrap up this session thank you again good day